Hello, this is Dr. Joachim Ix, Professor in Chief of the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension at UC San Diego. I'll be discussing the salient changes to the new CKD MBD KDGO guidelines from 2017. These guidelines are available as a resource and a reference tool. And my goal here is to provide a selection of the most relevant uh, recommended changes to clinical practice. The 2017 guidelines pr provide a comprehensive review of research findings since the prior CKD MBD guidelines in 2009, uh, and how this new literature might influence evidence-based clinical practice. While the new guidelines are too extensive to be fully reviewed here, my goal is to highlight some key aspects of the 2017 CKD MBD guideline updates with an emphasis on the rationale for changes made to the original guidelines. I would also like to bring your attention to a relevant summary article from the working group chairs of the, of the updated guidelines, which provides key points for practice application. This publication, entitled Executive Summary of the 2017 KDGO Chronic Kidney Disease, Mineral and Bone Disorder Guideline Update, What's Changed and Why It Matters, was authored by Dr. Marcus Kettler and his colleagues and was published in July 2017 in Kidney Inter International. We have also included a link to the summary article for your access, so please see the downloads associated with this program. Before beginning my analysis, let's hear about some of the highlights from the working group co-chairs and from their perspective. We asked, what are the three most important highlights or findings of the updated guidelines? Dr. Kettler responded with the following. From my point of view, one paradigm shift is the perception that bone mineral density measurements by DEXA is a valuable diagnostic tool in the assessment of fracture risk in all stages of CKD. Nephrologists still need to be aware that such BMD measurements do not identify the type of renal osteodystrophy and that a low BMD does not necessarily indicate the presence of classic osteoporosis, but results may indeed be, help, be a help to guide treatment decisions. A second major point is that the growing concern about inappropriate calcium loads in all stages of CKD, especially in CKD patients not on dialysis, excess exposure to calcium may be harmful. In dialysis patients, it may be more appropriate to tolerate mild and in asymptomatic hypocalcemia than with supplementing large amounts of calcium in order to reach normal serum calcium levels when calcium mimetics therapy is administered. As a consequence, this limits the use of calcium-based phosphate binders in CKD in a more general way than previously. Third, the recommendation to avoid routine use of active vitamin D compounds in CKD patients not on dialysis challenges past concepts. Nevertheless, a moderately elevated PTH may be an adequate compensa comp compensatory mechanism to counteract phosphate overload and to overcome PTH resistance of the bone in a stage-dependent fashion, while the side effects of drug-induced hypercalcemia may carry patient-related risks. However, autonomous hyperparathyroidism may still be uh, prevented in this group of patients, so progressive rises in PTH levels, especially in the presence of hypocalcemia, will still need to be treated with calcitriol or its analogs. We then asked, what impact do you think these updates will have on the management of patients with CKD mineral bone disorders? And Dr. Kettler responded, a more frequent use of bone mineral density measurements may provide improved guidance to therapies aimed at bone health in CKD patients. Longitudinal results may allow estimates of therapeutic effectiveness of all available medications, including calcium mimetics and active vitamin D analogs, but also in appropriate exceptions uh, anti-resorptive or bone anabolic substances. The more restriction of calcium exposure may hopefully lead to a more sustained protection from extraosseous calcification and thus to less cardiovascular complications. The same may be true for a more restricted use of activi activated vitamin D analogs in earlier stages of CKD. Here, it may be worthwhile to ascertain a solid basal vitamin D status based on a 25 hydroxy vitamin D level in order to limit progressive progression of hyperparathyroidism, although the evidence level on this issue still needs to be improved.
So let's take a look at some of the key guideline changes that uh, clinicians providing best clinical practice should be aware of. The first is guideline number 3.2.1. One major change to the guidelines now suggests that bone mineral density measurements may have clinical utility in patients ac across the spectrum of CKD. Previously, the 2009 guidelines recommended against bone mineral density testing in patients with CKD. At that time, there were no data demonstrating that bone mineral density measurement predicted fracture risk in CKD patients, and it did not identify the underlying cause of bone disease. The new guidelines, however, highlight a number of studies published since 2009 that consistently demonstrate that low bone mineral density does indeed predict fracture risk across the spectrum of CKD, including dialysis patients. While it remains true that bone mineral density cannot distinguish between low turnover or high turnover bone disease, bone mineral density measurement is now recommended if it might alter diagnostic or therapeutic approaches. For example, a low, mo a low bone mineral density might lead to a bone biopsy, which could alter the therapeutic approach. Or, if a patient with an EGFR greater than 30 milliliters per minute per 1.73 meters body surface area, uh, a low bone mineral density may lead to a decision to use bisphosphonates or other therapies. A second guideline is number 4.1.2, which relates to the management of phosphate levels in CKD patients. Previously, the 2009 guidelines recommended maintaining phosphate levels within the normal range in patients with CKD stage 3 to 5, and specifically recommended use of intestinal phosphate binders. The implicit assumption was that patients with normal phosphate levels might still benefit from lowering phosphate absorption in an effort to prevent future worsening of the CKD-MBD complex. The revised guidelines recommend targeting normal phosphate levels among patients with hyperphosphatemia. This is in recognition by KDGO that there is currently an insufficient evidence base to recommend treating patients with normal phosphate levels. Second, the revised guidelines suggest using phosphate-lowering therapy rather than phosphate-binding agents. This is because several well-conducted clinical trials have shown only modest reduction, reductions in serum phosphate levels uh, with binders and simultaneously some evidence of harm. These agents have been linked with worsening of vascular calcium deposition and can cause nausea and other GI symptoms. While still potentially useful, the new terminology of phosphate-lowering treatments encompasses possible other approaches, including binders, dietary therapy, and dialysis that may be more effective, moving the primary focus away from binders alone. A third guideline is number 4.1.6, restricting calcium exposure across patients with CKD. While calcium-based intestinal phosphate binders had, have consistently been associated with worsening vascular calcification deposition in dialysis, in dialysis patients, a number of studies conducted in patients with CKD stages 3 to 5 that have been published since the 2009 guidelines now show that calcium-based binders may also worsen calcification in earlier stages of CKD. These guidelines highlight that excess exposure to calcium through diet, medications, or dialysis may be harmful across all GFR categories of CKD. Finally, guideline 4.2.2. This guideline recommends that calcitriol and vitamin D should not be routinely used in CKD patients. While these drugs are commonly used in CKD stages three to five to suppress PTH, the guidelines recognize that the target PTH level in this stage of CKD are unknown. Moreover, recent clinical trials have shown that active vitamin D analogs did not significantly prevent progression of left ventricular mass, and yet increased the risk of hypercalcemia and other adverse events. Balancing these new insights, the revised guidelines suggest that the use of calcitriol or vitamin D analogs should be reserved for patients with severe or progressive secondary hyperparathyroidism. When initiated, calcitriol or vitamin D analogs should be started at low doses and titrated based on the PTH response with the goal of avoiding hypercalcemia. So I'd like to provide my thoughts and analysis of this important document. The main, the main uh, points of the study from my perspective are as follows. Firstly, 
Perhaps the most dramatic shift in practice guidelines is the recommendation to avoid routine use of calcitriol and activated vitamin D analogs in CKD patients. The guidelines hi highlight the risk of hypercalcemia and the uncertainty of PTH target targets. While this seems like a very rational approach in the absence of data, it highlights the need for additional research to define appropriate targets for PTH at different severities of CKDs. Such studies may require bone biopsies and uniformity in regards to PTH assays. It's important for the clinician to recognize that severe secondary hyperparathyroidism and progressive increases in PTH remain an indication for using vitamin D within the new guidelines. Second, use of bone mineral density measurements is also an important clinical change recommendation in these new guidelines. Since 2009, there have been a number of studies suggesting that bisphosphonates are useful for fracture prevention and appear to be safe in patients with an EGFR greater than 30. New therapies such as rank ligand inhibitors and IVPTH administration are additional new drugs in the armamentarium to address bone disease in select patients. For patients at high risk of fracture or with low bone mineral density, the recommendation may stimulate use of these medications in individual patients or referral for bone biopsy to determine the underlying cause of bone disease to guide further treatment. Lastly, the subtle changes in wording in the revised guidelines around phosphate management are also quite important. These changes reflect an acknowledgement by the KDGO panel on potential adverse effects of binders, including worsening of vascular calcification and a greater focus on other therapies such as diet and dialysis. In the future, additional research is required to identify therapies that can more potently, but also more safely, lower ph phosphate levels in CKD patients. With this, again, my name is Joachim Ix, and I want to thank you so much for participating. Please join us online for the linked articles discussed. Thank you.